A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Millions of dollars were funneled through this office to MJ-12 and then out to the contractors and was used to build top secret alien bases as well as top secret dumb or deep underground military bases. I think dumb is very appropriate. And the facilities promulgated by Alternative 2 throughout the nation. President Johnson used this fund to build a movie theater and paved the road on his ranch and I believe he also used it to fix his shower. He had no idea of its true purpose but he felt that because it was military money, it was his money. The secret White House Underground Construction Fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. And you can forget Pruman because Eisenhower has done everything that's been done to us, not intentionally, not to hurt us, in the beginning to protect us. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attacks, called presidential emergency sites. The sites are literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country that I can account for, which were built using money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission has built at least an additional 22 underground sites, again, that I can account for. The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of the military office of the White House and was and is laundered through a circuitous web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow. As of 1980, only a few at the beginning and end of this web knew what the money was for. At the beginning were Representative George Mahon of Texas, the Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and of its Defense Subcommittee, and Representative Robert Sykes of Florida, Chairman of the House Appropriations Military Construction Subcommittee. Today, it was rumored that House Speaker Jim Wright controlled the money in Congress and that a power struggle was underway to remove him. We all know what happened there, but I could not substantiate by any source the fact that he was in charge of the money. It is a rumor. At the end of the line were the President, MJ-12, the Director of the Military Office, and a Commander at the Washington Navy Shipyard. The money was authorized by the Appropriations Committee, who allocated it to the Department of Defense as a top secret item in the Army Construction Program. The Army, however, ladies and gentlemen, could not spend it, and in fact did not even know what it was for. Authorization to spend the money was in reality given to the Navy. You'll find out why the Navy has control of all this a little bit later. It'll become clear to you. The money was channeled to the Chesapeake Division of the Navy Engineers who did not know what it was for either. Not even the commanding officer who was an admiral knew what the fund was to be used for. Only one man, a Navy commander, who was assigned to the Chesapeake Division but in reality was responsible only to the military office of the White House, knew the actual purpose, amount, and ultimate destination of the top secret fund. The total secrecy surrounding the fund that meant that almost every trace of it could be made to disappear by the very few people who controlled it. There has never been, and most probably never will, be an audit of this secret money. Large amounts of this money were transferred from the top secret fund to a location at Palm Beach, Florida that belongs to the Coast Guard called Peanut Island. The island is adjacent to property which was owned by Joseph Kennedy. The money was said to have been used for landscaping and general beautification. The money did not begin to be transferred to Peanut Island until shortly after Kennedy's assassination. Some time ago, a TV news special in the Kennedy assassination told of a Coast Guard officer transferring money in a briefcase to a Kennedy employee across this property line. It was on television. Could this have been a secret payment to the Kennedy family for the loss of their son, John F. Kennedy? I think it was, but I can't prove it. The payments continued through the year 1967 and then stopped. 
The total amount transferred is unknown and the actual use of the money is unknown. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Nelson Rockefeller changed positions again. He had been in sort of a holding position until the time was right, and now the time was right. This time he was to take C.D. Jackson's old position, which had been called the Special Assistant for Psychological Strategy. With Nelson's appointment, the name was changed to the Special Assistant for Cold War Strategy. This position would evolve over the years into the same position Henry Kissinger was ultimately to hold under President Nixon. Officially, he was to give advice and assistance in the development of increased understanding and cooperation among all peoples. Sounds very nice and innocent, doesn't it? The official description, of course, was a smokescreen. For secretly, he was the presidential coordinator for the intelligence community. In his new post, Rockefeller reported directly and only to the president. He attended meetings of the cabinet, the Council on Foreign Economic Policy, and the National Security Council, which was the highest policy-making body in the government. Nelson Rockefeller was also given a second important job as the head of the secret unit called the Planning Coordination Group, which was formed under NSC 5412-1 in March of 1955. However, the memo was written in 1954 at the same time that NSC 10 and, or excuse me, NSC 5410 and NSC 5411 were written. It was not used until it was needed. The group consisted of different ad hoc members depending upon the subject on the agenda. The basic members were Rockefeller, a representative of the Department of Defense, a representative of the Department of State, and the Director of Central Intelligence. It was soon called the 5412 Committee or the Special Group. NSC 5412-1 established the rule for the first time, established the rule that covert operations were subject to approval by By secret executive memorandum, NSC 5410, Eisenhower had preceded NSC 5412-1 in 1954 to establish a permanent committee, not ad hoc, to be known as Majority 12, MJ-12, to oversee and conduct all covert activities concerned with the alien question. NSC 5412-1 was created to explain the purpose of these meetings when Congress and the press became curious as to why such important and prominent men were meeting on a regular basis. Majority 12 was made up of Nelson Rockefeller, the Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Welsh Dulles, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of Defense, Charles E. Wilson, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur W. Radford, and that's why the Navy got everything, because the first joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who served on MJ-12 was Navy. If it had been an Army general, the Army would have had it. The director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, and that should answer a lot of questions for you, and six men from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations known as the Wise Men. These men were all members of a secret society of scholars that called themselves the Jason Society. I see you smiling, Bill. Thought I didn't know it, didn't you? <coughs> Fooled you. Are the Jason scholars who recruited their members from the Skull and Bones and the Scroll and Key societies of Harvard and Yale? And that was stated verbatim in Operation Majority. The wise men were key members of the Council on Foreign Relations. There were 12 members, including the first six from government positions, thus majority 12. This group was made up over the years of the top officers and directors of the Council on Foreign Relations and later the Trilateral Commission. Gordon Dean, George Bush, and Zbigniew Brzezinski were among them. The most important, however, and influential of the wise men who served on MJ-12 were John McCloy, Robert Lovett, Averill Harriman, Charles Bolin, George Kennan, and Dean Acheson. <laughs>